Welcome and freely of your own will and leave some of the happiness that you bring. Today I am not reviewing Dracula, I am reviewing Jack Higgins' least known thriller, probably, Exocept, a 1983 novel and perhaps one of a fairly exclusive library of novels that is set during the Falklands War, which we won. But perhaps surprisingly for a novel about that conflict written by an Englishman, this isn't quite the propaganda fest that I expected. The plot takes place during the conflict with the Argentinian Air Force threatening the British task force with the French-made anti-ship Exocet missiles. However, their stocks are running low and without them, it is proposed that the British will be largely unopposed. So the Argentinians send their pilot Montero to secure more in France from a shady arms dealer. The British send Tony Villiers, this is his first novel, there are two with him. Um, they send him to find out what's going on and put a stop to it. He's aided and abetted by his ex-wife, the impossibly beautiful, sexy and glamorous Gabrielle Legrand. Legrand and Villiers are secret agents, obviously. Legrand is initially tasked with using her feminine wiles to get close to Montero, but the two immediately fall in love and she feels guilty about this and anger towards her commanding officers. Montero is in touch with the arms dealer who says that he can get the exocets despite there being an embargo. But the arms dealer has plans of his own. He's in the pay of the KGB and they think that by staging an international incident they can bring down the military junta in Argentina and install their own communist government. As such, Villiers' mission becomes a bit more important, the consequences further reaching. The source of the exocets is the French laboratory designing them. The KGB intend to perform an armed raid to grab the missiles, leaving behind Montero's identifiable corpse. So the French and NATO are then forced to respond. The Argentinians would then have no choice but to request Soviet help. Villiers and Legrand are held prisoner by the communists. They must escape to save Montero and prevent the communist plot from succeeding. Surprisingly for Higgins, who I've enjoyed reading in the past, this book is not very good. And I can't help but feel it was rushed out to cash in on the surge of nationalism after the war. But that argument is rather undercut by Higgins' positioning of the Argentinian Montero front and centre. Villiers, the supposed protagonist, actually disappears for the novel for a lengthy stretch, which is devoted almost entirely to the lacklustre and unconvincing love affair between Montero and Legrand. I think also that the low stakes, if you like, the, the lack of international involvement in the Falklands beyond Argentina and the UK, that's why he introduces this KGB element, which is a little bit unnecessary as well. Montero is described by Higgins like this. His face was pale, the eyes vivid blue, constantly in motion in spite of his apparent calmness. The elegant dress uniform fitted him to perfection, the medals making a brave show on his left breast. There was an energy to him, an eager restlessness that seemed to say he found such affairs trivial and longed for something more active. Now I wonder how one actually goes about that last part or why, but Montero is so handsome that even the hard-nosed Tony Villiers tries to set the Argentinian up with his ex-wife, and she's described like this. Her hair, no longer banded and gathered up as it had been that morning in Ferguson's office, was one of her most astonishing features, very blonde and cut in the French style known as Le Coupe Sauvage. It was long enough to hang between the shoulder blades, yet apparently short at the front, layered and feathered at the sides, framing a face of considerable beauty. Her eyes were the most vivid green, the high cheekbones gave her a Scandinavian look and her mouth was wide and beautifully formed. She was wearing an evening dress by Yves Saint Laurent in silver thread and tambour beading, the uneven hemline well above the knee, for the mini had returned to fashion that season. She balanced on silver high-heeled shoes, carrying herself with a touch of arrogance that seemed to say, take me or leave me, I couldn't care less. Putting aside the apparent sexism of Legrand's description being twice as long as Montero's, both characters are not just in these descriptions, but by other characters as well, described in ways that are quite ridiculous as these examples of pure perfection, when aside from their love affair, they actually have very little about their characters, Legrand's emotional outbursts aside. Yet these outbursts and her moody flip-flopping are at odds with her position as a spy of repute. Likewise, her immediate infatuation with Montero, which seems unlikely even before you consider the age gap, with him being 45 and her 27, begins before they've even met. Gabrielle stared down at the photo. It was like looking at an old friend, someone she knew well, and yet she had never seen this man before in her life. So much for her 
a haughty air, if you want to call it that. At the finale, with her identity as a British spy revealed, she seems able to move to Argentina for a bit of happily ever after with Montero without any issue. Unless she was a double agent all along, it seems extremely unlikely that the Argentinian government would welcome a confirmed British spy who is also the wife of a British serviceman. And this is before you consider that their reunion takes place on an Argentine airbase while the war is still going on, no less. A love like that, I guess, just can't be beaten, especially when it's born out of a mission that she herself described as lying back and thinking of England. But a romance like that just warms the heart. Whereas a romance built on dialogue like this just feels sick bags. When I left Rio Gallegas, we had lost approximately half our pilots. Down the drain, Gabrielle, all down the drain, such waste. She responded to his pain instinctively. Tell me about it, Raoul. Make me feel it. Get rid of it, my love. Get rid of it. Or perhaps this example. He pulled her close, kissed her neck. God, you smell good. Warm, womanly. Or am I being sexist and saying that? I'm never too sure of my position with you feminists. Oh, I'll explain your position in considerable detail. She smiled beautifully and ran a finger down his arm. I'm Gabrielle. Fly me. The issue with Montero is that Higgins needs to pick a side, and it shouldn't be the Russians or even the anti-Russians. I accept that this was released in the Cold War, but surely it's a really hard sell for anyone not fervently anti-British to care about Montero's quest to find his government more exocets. His exaggeration of the Argentinian casualties in the air war over the Atlantic fails to add any spice to proceedings because it's little more than a side, and I never ever cared at all about Montero. The only interest I had in him was wondering what his purpose was in the story beyond love of uninterest. When Montero is captured by the Soviets and taken to the Exocet Laboratory, his only value to them is as a corpse. And as that situation gets more and more out of hand, there are so many reasons to kill him and seemingly only plot armor to protect him, it almost gets embarrassing that it drags on so long. But there is even less reason to keep Villiers and Legrand alive after they were captured, and none at all for the KGB to explain their plan to Villiers and Montero before the latter's supposed death. If Higgins had picked a side and stuck with it, there could have been the beginnings of a decent espionage thriller here. The back of the book certainly seems to offer hints of one, but what we get instead is something that seems rushed in order to be topical rather than waiting for true inspiration to come. Adding to the sense that this was rushed out is the fact that it's a mere 237 pages and yet it really drags in the middle part of the book. The various plot threads are all in a holding pattern and Higgins jumps from one to the other every half page or so. The shortness of these scenes exposes the fact that nothing really happens in them and the story becomes fragmented and laboured and it wasn't particularly engaging to begin with. Whereas somebody like Lee Child or Dan Brown would use those same techniques to add pace to their work, this is just a novel drifting along rather than moving. The difference as far as I can tell is that Child and Brown try to end their chapters with a cliffhanger or a hook to keep you interested, whereas Higgins really doesn't. Here's a quick side-by-side -side comparison, and the pause button is your friend. The biggest issue with Exocet, though, for me, is that everybody in this novel is quite bad at their job. Montero simps so hard over Gabrielle, he ignores the ridiculous convenience of their meeting in Paris, although, to be fair, they are living on the same street, so perhaps an accidental meeting is quite likely. However, to ensure that it actually happens, Villiers hires a couple of rapists to attack Gabrielle, and then he's angry when his plan works. This unnecessarily contrived setup rings no alarm bells with Montero. Villiers also fails to notice in rural France in the middle of the night that he's being followed. But that's after he blows his cover by rushing to rescue Gabrielle from another set of rapists. The KGB plan is actually ridiculous and the agent Donna's refusal to kill any of the captured agents working against him, even when their death is part of the plan, is actually the stuff of Mike Myers' spoofs. Ferguson, the British chief, has a ludicrous amount of faith in the emotional Gabrielle before having to emotionally blackmailing her using the half-brother she never mentions or thinks about. To cap it all off, the final showdown between Donna's muscular and cruel bodyguard and Villiers lasts a grand total of nine lines. It's just another exocet with a bad fuse. In conclusion, I've really enjoyed some of Higgins' work in the past, particularly I enjoyed The Eagle Has Landed, 
This unfortunately feels rushed and uninspired. The characters never really engage, relying on their own incompetence to move a laborious plot along. Villiers disappears from his own story for a sizable chunk of the first act, making room for the love affair between Montero and Gabrielle, which would be a real grind even without some of the cheesy dialogue. The inclusion of the KGB makes the plot more convoluted than it needs to be. If Montero was the bad guy arranging this Exocet heist, his relationship with Gabrielle would be one fraught with danger. The plot would move along better without their uninspired simping and the unnecessary blurring of sides, which should be consigned to the bin where it belongs. As it stands, Exocet is less of a thriller and more of a romance, but overall it's about as romantic as a Valentine's card with a dirty limerick inside. Not really recommended, but if you watch this video this far, that was probably pretty obvious anyway. Thanks for watching, like and subscribe for more of this sort of thing. Bye!